Uh, we have uh, intros, which we will get to now, uh, unless. And we go. Are there any objections? Like this. Hit it. <laughs> Well, here we go again as we meet as the Friday Five with Republicans coronating Trump while Nikki Haley's still alive. We've got border deals, or maybe we don't. We're donating books to libraries, or maybe we won't. Sitting in his usual seat is our resident liberal antagonizer, but while the Donald continues to win, Larry's just a Trump agonizer. The Donald breathes through Iowa and then the Granite State. Two results, Larry Schultz has simply grown to hate. Good morning, Larry. Good morning. <laughs> Great to be here. <laughs> In the Mike Height chair, making another sub appearance, of course, is our resident animal expert who knows how to shoe a horse. Ken Matson knows how to mix with humans, and that's just fine. But the company he prefers is clearly that of the equine. Good morning, sir. Good morning. It is balmy, 60 degrees. It is balmy, isn't it? All that fog. Mike Carl is back, even though his drive was shrouded by fog. Last week, the snow kept him from being a Friday cog. While he was out, he took his share of heat. Although some of those shots from the Admiral are tough to repeat. <laughs> you, you got it badly. Mike was I, I heard every bit of it. I'm ready. I was on, I was on your side the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. No, he heard it, Rob. <laughs> I was on Mike's side. I would say, Bill, that's too harsh. Don't too you talk harsh. about Mike like that. Our next panelist rarely misses because of weather because he's on the phone. He could be sitting anywhere, but he does this show even on his throne. But Joe Ferretti did miss last week and was also subject to attacks because he was out catching planes and trying to avoid the Boeing Air Max. Good morning, Joe. <laughs> on my throne? Who told you? <laughs> I can hear the flush every now and then in the echo. Hey, you got to go, you got to go. His famous last words of that inspector in The Godfather. Finally, we come to our last introduction of the day. The fellow who sits at the head of the table, who's Harry's Gray. However, you'll have to forgive him if he's a little off with his scorning. Yesterday, his Tesla stock tanked. So today, Bill Stubblefield's in mourning. <laughs> yeah, did it ever. <laughs> Whoa, that was ugly. It was ugly. Did you get any of that back, Bill? I did. Maybe I'm not a, so far, I haven't got any back. Could be a change in the paradigm there, buddy. <laughs> exactly. Man, it was a bad day. Our uh, bad day, Captain, bad day. Our leadoff hitter is Joseph Ferretti. Joe, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Rob. Uh, you know, typically I try to stay with state and local issues when uh, – the time comes for me to discuss my issue of the day, but I, I, I've watched intently the results of the New Hampshire and Iowa, uh, both caucus and primary. And of course, it appears that Donald Trump is, is clearly the presumptive nominee for the Republican Party. And I think it's unquestioned that he is a political force, unlike anything, at least that I've seen going back to the 1970s when I started paying attention to politics. And I, I think he's one of the biggest political paradoxes I've ever seen. And I, I, I must admit, personally, I struggle trying to understand him and his movement. And I, to this day, I cannot put my finger on it. So I'm going to ask a question that I hope our other panelists who follow politics like I do can, can help educate me as to what's happening here. Because this is a guy who's vice president uh, – challenged him for the nomination and has said that uh, he has problems with uh, classified documents that are indefensible. His ambassador to the U.N. said he is unfit. His secretary of state, Pompeo, said he is not supporting him. His national security advisor, Bolton, has called him stunningly uninformed. His defense secretary, Esper, has said he's a threat to democracy. His chief of staff, John Kelly, has called him the most flawed person he's ever met. His communications director, Alyssa Farah, said he is historically dangerous. His first defense secretary, Mattis, said he abused his presidential authority. His attorney general, Barr, has said that he uh, will create a horror show in chaos if he's reelected. His White House communications director, Scaramucci, all of 11 days, said he's voting for Biden. His deputy, deputy press secretary, Sarah Matthews, says it's now democracy versus Trump. And of course, there's no love loss going the other way. If he's called uh, his UN secretary 
Nikki Haley at bird brain. He's called General Mattis the most overrated general in the history of this country. He's called his chief of staff, Mulvaney, a born loser. His press secretary, McElhaney, milk toast and a rhino. His transportation secretary, Chow, he refers to as Mitch McConnell's China-loving wife. He has 91 indictments in four states. His longtime accountant has entered a plea. His longtime personal attorney has served time. And he owes millions to a New York City socialite for sexual assault. And he is the presumptive nominee of one of the two major parties in our country. So somebody please explain to me what hold he has on a vast swath of the American electorate. How is this all working? Because I am just dumbfounded that this is where we are with one of our major presidential nominees. That's my question. Explain it to me, because I cannot understand it myself. Joe, how do you really feel about Donald Trump? (laughs) Personally, I loathe the guy, but politically, I recognize that he is a political force, and I'm trying to understand it, Rob. I, I, I I come from this honestly. I really am trying to understand his appeal. All right. Let me start with someone who's going to completely disagree with everything you said, Larry Schultz. Larry, go ahead. (laughs) Um, It could be uh, that one of the reasons he's so popular is because he supports um, taking strong action at the U.S. southern border. Oh, wait a minute. No, he doesn't support that. He used to. He used to say he was going to build a wall. (laughs) But now he's killing the one deal we've had in generations that would actually improve our security at the border. I'm just as lost as you are, Joe. He is uh, in every way not a person you'd want on your Christmas card list, let alone running your country. But there he is. He's, he's, He's running for it again. All right, Mike Carr, you take a shot at it. Yeah, and, and everybody understand that this this is the first words you've heard in this conversation from a lifelong Republican. And uh, I question the uh, truth of many of the quotations that we just heard. But aside aside from are, that, are, you, are you questioning Joe's research that they were actually said, or that Joe's, yeah, yeah. Joe's fabricating the quote? No, 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 no. I, I don't. You know, I'm sure he's he's reading, you know, stuff. But but I, but and I don't. Yes, I am. I, and I don't ask you to you know go behind it and you know show show where, where, whether it's true or not. It's it's just stuff that's reported. But that's that's one of the problems. But as a lifelong uh, Republican, you know. And and for the four years he was president, you know, I wasn't happy with Trump's style, but Trump's substantive policy agenda was absolutely what good Republicans support, and that is reduce taxes, promote the free enterprise system, and uh, good national security and, and, and strong international, you know, uh, uh, relations and protection of U.S. interests around the world. Uh, I, I I think he did a good job at that, and that's why um, so many Republicans are supporting him. Uh, it's in spite of you know his style. I, I'm not happy you know with that at all, but but the substance is what matters to me, and I think he's right on the substance, and he's a thousand times more correct than the liberals who are controlling Joe Biden, who is the compl- worst president in my life. <laughs> Billy. Okay. Yeah, uh, I had a question on one of my issues. Has there ever been a single person in such control of the party as Donald Trump? Uh, and I think that's the basic root of what Joe's asking. Uh, I had the opportunity last night. The Stubblefield Institute had a, uh, a speaker that was one of the most enlightening discussions I've heard in a long time. Among that group was E.J. Dion, who's a columnist for the Washington Post, but there was also a guy by the name of Ed Goes, uh, who is one of the foremost Republican pollsters, has been for the last several years, just recently written a book that is New York Times bestseller. I asked a question to the symbol group. Uh, what made Trump so popular, and why is he the single most uh, influential person in the Republican Party? Without, without 
any exception, all of them pushed back on me. Especially the guy, Ed Gould, the pollster, said that is not correct. Said if you look at the numbers, if you dissect the numbers, and he was able to quote chapter and verse much in greater detail than I can. He said there is a there's a approximately one third numbers we've heard before one third on the Republican base that's going to vote him and uh, uh, going to support him and everything regardless. So that is counted by the approximately, I said one-third, about 15%. Counted by 15% on the Democratic side that feels the same way about the uh, Democratic candidate. He said the other 70%, there is a lot of question. Some of them will parrot just what Mike Carl said. They do not like him as an individual, but they did like his policy. But they said among these groups that Trump's influence is not nearly as great as what we tend to hear with these sound bites. These sound bites saying that he's going to win hands down. Both of these guys feel that in the next two or three months, as we work our way through South Carolina, Nevada, and the Super Tuesday, there are going to be some significant inroads made, especially if the good economy, which we have, which is 3.4% uh, GDP, 3.5% unemployment, 3.5% inflation, all very good numbers. Once these start being recognized as, as what they actually are, that it's going to be the vulnerability of Trump is going to start coming through. His poll numbers are interesting, Bill, that he cites. I don't doubt his skill as yeah. a pollster uh, or in researching the polls, but the turnout... In Iowa for the caucuses, fourteen uh, percent. But but of the, those who voted, every single group that Trump was failing in in his last election, he improved in and turned out strongly for him. And this is while DeSantis and Haley were still in consideration. So I don't know that he. I don't know if his polls are wishful thinking or if they were conducted before the Iowa caucus. But the Iowa numbers, granted, again, 14% turned out, but still, he killed it in every category that you can imagine, demographically, yeah. uh, th that they measure. He killed it. He did. That comes back to the sound bites we had. And this, uh, this fellow is looking at the no numbers in total, and he acknowledges the fact that Trump did very well in, in uh, Iowa. He also did, I think, New Hampshire is a much more telling state than, uh, than Iowa. Iowa, the Republican base in Iowa is pretty strong Trump. In New Hampshire, you had a lot of independence, and you had a lot of, uh, uh, you had something like 40%, 45%. MAGA Republicans in New Hampshire, but that meant you had another 55% non-MAGA, and yet Trump won, reported double digits. They both said as the numbers come out, it's going to be a little bit less than that, but still a significant uh, victory for Trump in New Hampshire. Let me add one other aspect of this support issue, and that is starting in the 2016 election and, and growing even more in the 2020 election and in and, and, and the current polls is support of Trump, a growing percentage support of Trump from Spanish Americans and African Americans. And I, th I, would, I wouldn't say that's great. Or, I mean, it's, you know, it's good for Trump, you know, as a pragmatic man, a factor, but I think it's more of an adverse reaction to the, the liberal Democrats. That's why they're losing Spanish Americans and African American support. Kenny Matson. Well, we only hear certain messages and outrageous comments from certain media sources, right? So that's what gets to clicks, that's what gets to views, and that's all we hear. But I think it goes further back. In 2010, there was redistricting. And I, think, I believe this is where it all really began. Then everyone made their little districts, everyone became safe. They didn't have to be in the middle anymore. They didn't have to placate to other voters who are not their party to get elected. Now along comes the the way the government has been run, worse poll ratings, roaches get a better rating than Congress does, and now along comes a man, I can do it. I can fix it. Placating to everyone's worst demons instead of placating to their an better angels. So when you have voter, uh, uh, voters mad at the way the government is being run, 
and apparently both parties really don't care because as long as they're sitting in power and collecting 175 a year and don't listen to the plights of the people, you're going to have a voting block that's going to go, I want that person. He's going to do it or she. But right now we're talking about Trump. So now we have a, a I'm cynical, as you know, I've, I've had so many times people will say, hey, my horses don't kick. All right. So and I get kicked. So I always take a little I always uh, take things with a grain of salt. So what's the behind, what's the motive behind this tearing down our democratic institutions to, as you already heard him say, to create an authoritarian state. Right now, not authoritarian state, but I'm going to be authoritarian for one day. I'm sorry, Stalin, Hitler and Mussolini wasn't authoritarian for one day. Neither was Caesar. So I think that's where his popularity is. Uh, he's placating to the anger of a voting block and then when that voting block gets so emotional then hey he's not loyal enough um, i gotta do what trump says because if i don't because we're here just in, in, the, in the cloakroom i don't want someone threatening my family or my life right so look at the, what happened to the poll workers so now you have a fear factor involved and that's where I think, in Joe's thing, this is where it is. You're, you're placating people's emotions and where how they distrust uh, the government as it is now. And then they're looking at somebody going, I can fix it. I can do it. So. Look, can, I add, Good, can I add to something Mike uh, Carl said a second ago? And Mike mentioned that the Hispanics and the black population are shifting over to, uh, to the Republicans. And numbers show that there is some some movement but what's more interesting to me would be the youth and the youth has backed biden last time but if they do not get some resolution on this israeli gaza yeah. conflict the youth are going to be abandoning biden in great numbers they uh they voted for haley in new hampshire uh, yeah. by the way that was the one area where trump did not do so well mm-hmm. joe you asked why i'm going to give you a couple of answers just from like observations over the years first and foremost why doesn't any of this stuff stick to trump and i think it's because of the clintons and the eight clinton years and in fact uh, in my today in history i think this is the day bill Lewin- bill bill Lewinsky, yeah. bill clinton said i did not have sex with that woman monica Lewinsky. i think this is the date that that actually took place if i remember reading that earlier this morning for the longest time Republicans have complained about the Clintons and they were investigated for a variety of things and it's always been assumed that they got away with everything and never were prosecuted for all the transgressions Republicans believe the Clintons committed, whether it's Bill or, or Hillary. So Trump comes along, he's got a few things that are against him, right? Well, after watching Bush 41 take it, after watching Bush 43 take it, I, I think you even go back to their, what's happened to Reagan's uh, reputation and legacy since he left office. <clears throat> Republicans have had enough of Republican icons being torn down with no defense while the Clintons got away. And I'm not telling you they got away with it or didn't. I'm telling you what the perception is. Well, the Clintons got away with everything. And Republicans have finally said, that's enough. We don't care anymore. You know what? This is our guy who's going to stand up loudly. He's going, to, he's going to back us. You got away with it for so many years. What do we care what he's done? It doesn't matter because we like his policies. And you got away with it before anyway. And I'll throw this out there too. The social issues. You can't deny social issues are a big part of what's going on right now. When I took my coach's exams and have to do so many hours of online training and whatever, part of the... Uh, School board policy in Frederick County uh, boils down to uh, one line that really grabs your attention. That is, if there is an overnight school trip and your son identifies as a girl, he has to be accommodated with the girls on an overnight field trip. That's school board policy. Okay. Now, you look at that and you go, from a common sense standpoint, that doesn't make any sense. Okay. When in history, when in the history of, of 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 youth have we said that's fine? Until now. And the policy is, you don't agree with this, you don't coach. Okay. So 
I think people have stood up and they've said, this doesn't make sense anymore. We've, we've gone too far. And someone needs to stop it. And Trump is the guy that stands up loudly and belligerently says, I'll stop it. And people say, well, I've got no other options. This is the guy. This is the guy I'm going to back, Joe. So no matter what else, he's on my side with things that I believe in, regardless of his warts. And I think, Joe, that's the reason why he continues to enjoy such huge support among his base. I, yeah, I think that's a very valid point, Rob. And, and I, I would take it one step further. I, I think that the Trump phenomenon is, is also a reaction to the Obama years, because what did we hear uh, in the aftermath of the Obama administration? Was a lot of people, especially in our state, oh, the, you know, the Dem- I'm leaving the Democratic Party because they've left me. And I think that 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 feeling has been pervasive uh, in other states and in other demographics. Uh, and and I think that this is a reaction to that, too. And so, yeah, yeah, I think you're right that there's for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. But w- what I scratch my head about is that when Mike Carl brings up, well, you know, we don't like the man, we like the policies. Well, everybody I quoted this morning not only liked Trump's policies, they helped implement them. And they're warning us, I worked for the man and I can't support him. So this is on a whole new level in my mind. Uh, I mean, this, this is more than just uh, you know policies in debate. This, this is more to, to the very essence of the individual who we're going to be asked to consider in November. And so I, I see this, and, and that's what I struggle with, Rob. I think this is at a, a different level of, of uh, scrutiny that, that we're being asked to engage in by the very people he hired and who worked for him. And so I, 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 that's what I struggle with, and I don't know how that's ultimately going to be resolved. But clearly it is, uh, you know, he, he's a political force that you cannot deny. He has remade the Republican Party to the point where I don't know what the word conservative means anymore. Now, you have good people in our state who are being labeled rhinos, who we know better. But that's where the discourse is. And I, it is something that I just cannot comprehend myself. Uh, so I, I, I hope that um, you know, we'll, we'll get more information and more understanding as we go forward. And sure, Biden has his warts, too. There's no doubt about it. We understand our choice is terrible uh, coming up here in November. But uh, I've never seen anything like this. And it is uh, it's going to be interesting where it leads us. Could, Could I add one thing? Sure. They lost the 16 election popular vote, but won in the Electoral College. Then they lost the 18 election. Then they lost the 20 election. Then they won the 22 election after telling us there was going to be a Republican landslide, and they got a trickle. This The, the record of this individual uh, who seems to be taking over um, is not very good when you count the votes at the end of the day and refuse to lie about what they say. His record isn't very good. So... As the Republican Party goes further down this path of loving these policies while ignoring the sins of the man himself, I think we're going to find that the sensible people in this country are going to continue to hand them losses. And eventually, they'll have to see it. They'll have to. You were about to breathe into something? Well, you know, Mike Heitz said something about giving Governor Justice kudos for all the things he'd done for West Virginia. And Mike Heitz said, no, 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 no. That was the legislature. So if you're going to do that same train of thought, ain't Trump did do the policies. It was Congress. Joe carried us on the national scene. I'm going to bring us back to the state scene. Uh, the Republicans have long said they're for small government. With some of the social programs they're pushing through now, leave the impression they're for big government. Big government that's telling us how to raise our children. Big government tells us how in our bedrooms. Big government tells us so many ways to life. Again, some of the social issues. And there are several examples, but one of which is uh, House Bill 4654. Brandon Steele introduced uh, this past week. Uh, It's... uh, uh, 
in essence, what it does is removes the exemption from libraries, schools, and museums for displaying something of an obscene nature. Uh, there's several problems with this. Uh, one is the definition of obscene, obscenity. It's in state statute, but it's 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 open for interpretation. Uh, the penalty is proposed twenty five thousand dollars for an offender, a librarian or a school or a, a museum or t- a school teacher, twenty five thousand dollars or five years in jail. This strikes me as taking a a sledgehammer to a problem that can be addressed a lot of different ways. Uh, ch- parents themselves differ on what they want their children to, uh, uh, to be able to have access to. Leave that to the parents. Don't have the uh, legislators telling what the parents should or should not have the children be, a- be aware of. You can control the access to this material through a lot of different ways. One is you can keep it within the uh, uh, under the the librarian's desk so that they would be able to dis- dispense if somebody wants a certain uh, book. They can have the teachers let them know what they want their children to to read. Uh, back in my day, some parents were against catching the rye because of homosexual overtones. Other parents felt their children should be exposed to it. Let the parents do that with an agreement with the uh, uh, with the educators uh, there's uh, and with our technology you can very easily keep track of what a parent would like uh, or the exposure for the children don't don't throw this whole responsibility on the backs of a poor poor librarian with a threat of jail time or hefty fine <clears throat> this in, to me invokes going back to the early days of Reformation, when John Whitcliffe, uh, Whitcliffe and others were actually put at the stake for translating the, the Bible from the Latin version to the English version. People took exception to that, so they put them, they burned them at the stake. Am I saying this is the same? No, on the scale it's not the same. But the concept is the same. S- a certain group of people telling everybody else what they view as obscenity, and that to me is going back to big brother or big government now telling folks what to do. So my question is, are we on a slippery slope with and House Bill 5641, 4654 rather, is just one example. There's others. There's the uh, Meet Baby of Bolivia and uh, uh, some of the others. Are we on a slippery slope with the direction we're going? All right. I think what lends some credibility to what Bill's talking about is uh, he was there when John was uh, burned at the stake, so he he remembers he was, that. He day. was my Al, buddy. I, he lit the match. Bill yeah. was yeah. 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 No, no, I, I cannot get the smell out of my nostrils, Larry. It's stuck with me for years. And it's also similar to what we saw in the 1930s. Uh, next thing you know, you got Prohibition, right? Yeah. Hey, uh, here's uh, Mike Carl. Well, uh, I, I agree with your you know, criticism of, of that particular bill. But, but I disagree with your suggestion that it's typical of what's going on in today's Republican legislature. Quite the contrary. The Parents' Bill of Rights is there's, – there's several versions of that in, 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 you know, are proposed that require uh, exactly the kind of parental involvement in, in you know, managing subjects – that, that that you just advocated and that I uh, uh, agree with. So so don't don't uh, take this one exception and and suggest that this is a pattern among the majority, the leaders of the Republican legislature. Did Mr. Carl get the right focus on your response well, that you're looking for? And I, I'm saying, and I use one example, there are three or four or five cultural bills that all are designed to interpret what what we should be doing and how we should be living our lives. And I, that, to me, is the, the, the big government that we should, should not. I, I have a partial list in front of me of many bills that go just the other way. Uh, one is prohibiting the teaching of CRT and other wokeness in public schools. That should be, uh, the, in other words, that, that is to... That's strong for parents, and it's good for children, and, and it, it, it's important. Uh, there are uh, 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 
a bill that uh, objects gender identity and sexual orientation instruction. In other words, it, 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 it prohibits it, really, and prohibits the teaching of racial, sexual, political bias in schools. Um, there's another, oh, yeah, prohibiting punishment of teachers who insist on using actual physical uh, gender-driven pronouns for children. You know, that's what we need to go back to, and that's a reaction to, to, to the trends that we've been, we've been seeing. Uh, that, that's a good enough list there, Mike. Okay. I, don't want, I don't want to go down the whole thing there, but uh, okay. I want to keep the discussion okay. going here. I, I, there's, I only got half of them, but I'll... <laughs> <laughs> well, you still have a turn later. Ken Manson. Um, I'm really surprised that they haven't started banning the Constitution. You know, that pesky little document that says, we the people, we are created equally, endowed with our creator with certain inalienable rights. Right? That sounds awfully woke to me. Because woke is diversity, <laughs> in equality, and fair play, basically justice towards everyone. Right? right? That's the definition that we hear. Right? So I'm surprised they haven't put that in there. So, but you're right, Bill. There are some, some bills in here that are going a little too far into cultural issues. I mean, this, yeah, they got elected, but it's, look what they've done for the state in regards to financially. Right? So now it seems to me they're just getting bored and want to do social issues, right? So um, the one thing with this bill, and Mike brought it up, parental rights bill, right? So let the parents decide what their kid has access to. Same thing with the church, the prayer, a certain religion, right? We're gonna teach this, uh, intelligent design. This is what you're gonna be taught here at public school. You wanna learn creationism by our by our creator then you go to church or bible study that's it so we're being forced into certain things in regards to social issues and i agree on some you know the things you had in regards to pronouns and things like that it gets a little a little too too far to the left but um i agree with bill is there's a lot of things that are being shoved down our throats and having the legislature tell us what they want us to do instead of having the parents decide what they want to do. And I think that's where we are. One, one related bill, in fact, it was the next one I was going to list, is to require high school seniors to pass a test on the U.S. Constitution for graduation. I don't think a lot of legislators will pass that either. Yeah, they ought to take that first. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. they, they might vote for it, but they couldn't pass the test. <laughs> right. I have to read it before I vote on it. Oh, we voted it before I read it. <laughs> Joe Ferretti. What Bill brings up, I think, is, is something that we're seeing uh, in a lot of areas in the country. Uh, I think we have to face the facts here that this is a country where less of us go to church on a regular basis, less of us identify with a certain religion, whether it be Catholic, Protestant, uh, Jewish, Muslim, whatever. There is... Uh, uh, the the statistics are clear that this is a country that is distancing itself from religion and 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 ordinary everyday walks of life and i think what we're seeing is a reaction in some state governments to try to reverse that trend by uh, legislating that you know, we've got to start changing the thinking of this country. We've got to become a little bit more religious and a little bit more dedicated to the Bible or whatever other text you believe is, is the guiding principles of your life. I think that's what's going on here. And uh, I don't know that that's the right approach because it, it, it certainly has government getting involved in religion, and we understand the constitutional restraints regarding that. But I, I just sense that that is what's developing in this country, and I think we're going to be entering into a, a, a very big debate about the role of state governments and local governments in in this uh, in this realm, because it is clear that uh, a lot of folks are, are dismayed and upset with the direction of this country, and feel that a lot of the root causes of this country are due to the fact that uh, less and less of us are can consider ourselves religious. 
And, and I, I just think that's the debate that's going to continue for quite some time. Larry Schultz. Yeah. Um, to follow on what Joe uh, is saying, there's a, a great uh, interest now in the Republican Party, uh, both statewide and nationally, of raising as many culture war issues as they possibly can. And so, you know, after all, um, uh, they know what's right because their culture has taught them what's right with regard to any kind of behavior. And therefore, rather than do the job of government, which would be, for example, to fix our foster care system, to fix our roads, to improve our schools from 50th to somewhere uh, uh, better than that, Rather than do that job, which is tough and is what we hired them for, they want to make a list of Sunday school promises that they can get passed into laws and use the police to enforce them. It's a total waste of time. West Virginia's problems do not arise from people using the wrong pronoun for themselves in fifth grade. That's not where our problems came from. These problems have been around for a long time before that issue ever came up. So what I would say is when you hear uh, a politician campaigning, and you will, on the number of wo uh, the number of anti-woke bills that he introduced or she, mark it down. That's a person with no accomplishments in any other part of the actual governing. Every time you hear them talking about pronouns, Ask them about those foster care kids. And you'll, you'll find out they don't have a lot to say about that. Because West Virginia is worse than the nation at that. We're worse than a nation for almost anything that has to do with children in this whole country. And so...